गुड इवनिंग एंड थैंक यू वेरी मच प्रोफेसर मटू फॉर गिविंग मी दिस ऑपरचुनिटी इट फील्स एस इफ आई एम सिटिंग देर टू लिसन टू समबडीज लेक्चर विच इज वॉट आई डन वेन एवर आई वॉज यूर क्वाइट सम डी केड्स अगो टू थिंक दैट इट वॉज अबाउट थर्टी टू फोर्टी ईयर्स अगो दैट आई वॉज यूर दैट्स अ लॉन्ग पीरियड ऑफ टाइम and uh, so many different things had happened and that's not the intention with which i'm standing before you to talk but memories are very fresh jnu has its own imprint in our minds and uh, the way it evolves a person so let me pay my tributes and respects to the institution from where i've really learned a lot so thank you very much jane for that you have asked me to speak on the vision of vikas Vik sat bharat in an evolving global landscape the vision is for vikas sat bharat and vikas sat by 2047 certainly but i'm going to have to explain a few things which gives us the confidence to have a vision for a viksit bharat and 2047 of course is a milestone which can endure every indian and therefore pegging it for at 2047 has a particular reason which all of us can appreciate but what exactly have we done which gives us the confidence to think that viksit bharat as a vision is implementable is achievable is attainable i'll just place a few things before you which tells you partly how we've handled a few things and equally it can simultaneously explain how this evolving global landscape is actually shaping everything that whether you like it or not everything that we do and everything that we do just not in india but in relation to other countries as well so when i'm talking to students of the school of international studies i'm not not just talking about the fiscal and economic policy decisions but also contextually put um, continuously put it in the background or the landscape of a globe globe which is ever evolving ever changing and these are not changes which are going to be Uh, small and measurable they are transformative changes some very unpredictable some black swan events all of which make it very complex so actually if i were to say in management i think there is this wuka principle uh where you're talking about volatility you're talking about uncertainties you're talking about complexities and you are also then talking about how you can adapt to things so as wuka is now a default setup you don't have a choice you're working in it you are facing volatility you are facing uncertainties of unseen unmeasured uh dimension and with all these uncertainties how economies have been uh, thrown to different corners within a room let us say as though you're a shuttle uh, playing individual you're running from one to another and sorting things out so that there's some kind of a stability uh, broadly uh, and then finally in this context reading the country for the next several years next several decades is the instrument of adaptability that you infuse into the system so that it can be ready for any other eventuality so i have just stated the uh, broad contours which i want to speak about or speak within so when i entered the finance ministry in 2019 the challenges were as though oh they were very big challenges i didn't know that time was was to hit us it was a challenge of indian markets requiring more liquidity it was a challenge of slowing economy 
and how you would want to do things from the government to prop it up, stimulate it. So you're doing things which are very well within the economic domain, policy domain. But even then, the, sit the situation of our banks were not really all that uh, rosy as yet. We had to still work at them. So the changes which we brought in corporate tax, uh, bringing it down to the lowest which you see anywhere in the world for new enterprises and so on, were deliberate measures to make sure the bank's balance sheet and also the balance sheet of the corporate world would improve so that ultimately the economy has to run big or small. All of them needed the comfort of liquidity coming through banks. But that was, as I said, a smaller issue to handle. The bigger ones came in from 2020, or that of COVID, that of an economy which went into the negative terrain, and post which the recovery had to be comprehensive solutions or galore came before, before us as suggestions. But which one to choose and which one not to choose uh, were all uh, very testing uh, environment where you the intervention that you were making to make sure you're hand-holding people had to be done in time and in the fashion in which they would prefer and so on. So meeting these challenges, I would think could be done only because there was a responsive government, a government which was ready to listen to people, listen to those affected, listen to those observers, listen to experts, and sieve through all the suggestions that you've got to make sure that you're able to come up with one, two, three, or a few more uh, steps which can be treated as relief giving. But it is there the complexity uh, was far more than what you would have to work on because there was no template. The 1919, 1920, 30, Spanish flu, or any of that, hadn't left institutional memories behind as to how countries can handle them. So even in India, a pandemic of this nature, uh, a pandemic where India was not alone, but yet India had its own sizable problem because of our population, the diversity and the distance with which we had to reach people with basic medical facilities and so on. So absence of a template was itself a challenge, but a big opportunity as well. So you knew how to uh, you know, tailor make something based on what the kind of inputs which came from affected sections. So you had the liberty to do that. But the challenge was you're listening to 10,000 different suggestions, which of it would work and which of it wouldn't and which can be afforded and so on, where the challenge we worked with all of that. But one thing which we kept going, and I want to say this with all sense of discretion, is we did not let go the opportunity for bringing in systemic reforms. And it is that systemic reform which was undertaken even during this period, or to improve on the systemic reforms which were brought in earlier, all played out in the last few years post-COVID. And that is why we are saying that the recovery can impact so many different sections and benefit the economy overall. That's not to say there are sections, uh, there are no more sections where you, there might be more to be done. They are there. But overall, for us to have picked up so much and to have gone this far is purely because of the multiple things that we did during that phase, not thinking that it is a time only to provide medical assistance and somewhat some relief for the economic stress that people were going through. So it was all together, the lack of template, as I said, was blessing as well as a challenge. So we went through the process and we realized that there were a few steps which could never be given up. The effort at bringing transparency in the way in which government functions the effort at making sure the formalization of the Indian economy happens, the effort at making sure people who need to receive the assistance from the government or the financial uh, benefits do get it and get it in full and in time. 
So technology was the one answer that we had in our hand. So we made sure transparency was serviced. People would get their money into their account directly. Pilferages will be cut out. And these brought in confidence from the people. So when we went to, for instance, the G20 during our presidency, the kind of things much before we could showcase the interest shown by the participating countries were on these measures, which were not only introduced, scaled up, and used as a very powerful tool in making sure development reaches everybody and inclusion happens so that there need not be a special drive for inclusion. Oh, this particular section did not get uh, got uh, did not get included, and therefore we need to go there. No, technology across the board has enabled at least the first touch point, post which you had to tighten up, post which you had to ensure that the buoyancy is kept up. So, um, in a way, technology adoption. Technology adoption, not just for bringing in the bank accounts to everybody's doorstep. Technology adoption also for making sure that people who live in far-flung areas can access the global markets, for which you need to give them access which doesn't cost, skill that is needed for accessing, and make sure that access itself is largely in mother tongue. And that is where the technology adoption was a success story and continues to be one even today because we made sure that every region, every state and the linguistic uh, requirements were met with the technology being facilitated in mother tongues. So if we were to understand, I'm, I'm not elaborating much more on this because these were the foundation in which basic necessities reach the bottommost rung. Whether getting a pakka house, whether you're getting electricity 24 by 7, India was a power shortage country till before 2013. In fact, it was till before 2014 December after the new government came in. Post which ramping up production of power and making sure that the monetization uh, of the lines and making sure the monitoring of these were all completely efficiently run, the disturbance in uh, power transmission and also the pilferage which happened were all brought down to the minimum. So if you were to provide electricity 24 by 7, make sure that financial inclusion happens, People who deserve to get some assistance from the government receive it and receive it in time. And every household at least had enough food grains supplied to them. During COVID, we ensured that we also gave them pulses. And then uh, cooking gas, weaning people away from unfriendly smoke-filled kitchens so that they can be healthier, providing toilets, sanitation in villages. These have been continuously monitored and to the extent that at one stage, 112 districts in India were identified that even if some of them were within a large, well-developed state, say for instance, Maharashtra or Haryana, you still had some of the districts which were not as developed as the others. So the selection of all those across the country were treated separately as aspirational districts. Similar fundamental activity were to be performed there so that they come at par with the rest of the districts in that state. I'm glad to say that among the 112 which were picked up like that, nearly 60 of them were from East India, Bihar, Jharkhand, um, Orissa, and West Bengal. And these 62, of course, when I say West Bengal, I'm uh, uh, bringing it in the definition of those districts which come into aspirational districts. West Bengal didn't participate in the aspirational district program because they chose to stay away from it. But those districts which got the attention for the last three years, 
I'm happy to say they are now at least as good as the rest of the districts in those uh, states. Now, this program of developing at the bottom level has now from district level come down to the block level. So we are making sure at the granular level, we will reach out to people to make sure most of these wellness centers, inoculation, children's health, nutrition, portion of beyond that is, all of them reach there. Now, these are being done even as we are attending to the food security of the nation. And that's where I want to bring in because that has a very big story from the global evolving global landscape. We import majority of our fertilizers. Roughly, you have urea, you have DAP. A bag of urea has always been kept at a certain price irrespective of what happens to the input cost or bringing in logistics or whatever. So assume a bag costs something like 300, it costs 280 to 300 something, a bag full of urea. During COVID and slightly afterwards as well, a bag of that urea, that quantum of urea, reached 2,980 rupees. We had to import it. There was no go. We brought it in, did not disrupt the supply to the farmers. The same 300 rupees or 280 rupees was charged. The extra burden was taken up on the shoulders of the government. We didn't pass it on to state governments. We didn't pass it on to the farmers evolving global landscape directly hitting us. And similarly, there was a time when prices of crude oil went very much rock bottom. It was, I must say, absolutely timely a decision that we took to ensure that our strategic reserves all got filled up. We've got caverns in some port, closer to some port areas, both in the eastern seabed and also in the western seabed. So did we optimize our resources? Did we make sure that countries' best interests are kept um, top of everything? Yes, we did. Whilst we bore the burden, I don't want to use the word burden so that it is not misunderstood, but that extra cost in getting the fertilizer, equally, we also made use of the reduction in the price, global price of crude and filled up our strategic reserves. These are steps which were taken. If you went through the normal process, each of these decisions would have taken its own movement of files, getting cleared by one department, the finance department sitting or expenditure sitting over it and so on. But because, as they say in management, system thinking happens in this government. Government as an organization, as one organization, thinks with necessary speed and time consciousness that we didn't wait for files to keep moving. We just cleared some of the decisions and got the approval of the cabinet so that we could go ahead with severe, uh, stressful times without having to pass the burden on to the people. So if evolving global landscape is telling us that you are better off obtaining fuel from one area and not from another, where you have a traditional buyer-seller relationship. We just didn't think only that has to be honored. That has to be honored because long-term relationships are built. You depend on your Middle East supply of oil. You've had this relationship with Iran. You will get your fuel from them. But when it was apparent and very clear that we could benefit for India by obtaining the discounted crude from Russia. We went ahead. And there was huge threat of sanctions. Huge threat of sanctions. But that is where I think the leadership which has built a relationship with global leaders, countries, our diplomatic force, all of them were engaged to make sure that the sanction which exists, in fact, I would go to the extent of saying that some of the instruments which have been over the years innovatively brought in to ease global businesses, 
to make sure that global business, especially in the globalized world, everybody is integrated with one another, global value chains are all spread across the world. They were instruments which were innovatively brought into the system so that, say for example, payments can happen at cross-border efficiencies so that global trade can be more efficiently and payments can be more efficiently undertaken. But when that innovative tool, which is brought for efficiencies in global trade, efficiencies in cross-border payments, become a kind of a weapon, and in the name of sanction, those become a tool with which they tell you, mind you, you're not going to cross a certain line. Again, it was for India to evolve. Ways and means through which our fuel requirements at the cost which is going to benefit India are undertaken so that India's interest is kept on the top. And equally, we are not going to be on a confrontation with anybody, but through diplomatic channels, through leadership exchanges. Today, at least I'm very happy and proud to say, and I'm sure you'll be equally happy to know, that we can lift the telephone, the Prime Minister can speak to the heads of states and clearly say, this is my issue, I would want you to help us, I would want you to address this issue, whether it is people convicted, given even death sentence. The recent episode should be fresh in your mind. And one earlier, as soon as we came to power in 2014, there were probably five or six, I lose count now, of fishermen in a death row. They were given death sentence, where kept in Sri Lanka. But Prime Minister ensured that they were brought back to India and handed over to their families, the death sentence removed, imprisoned removed, and they were safely returned to their families. So it is a question of how your diplomatic relations, how your engagement globally, and how your leadership builds its relationship with other countries, which help us to navigate when the evolving global landscape goes against your interests. But yet you don't allow your interests to suffer. I can give you these three concrete examples. There are many more. Today, when looking at the stability, the fundamental macroeconomic stability of our economy, one of which is the currency, Indian rupee, being largely stable, in fact, mostly stable against most of the country, uh, international currencies, except for the dollar where it had definite volatility. But even in that case, compared to many other currencies, Indian rupee has been far more stable even against the dollar. And therefore, you find countries today wanting to have trade relationship built on rupee trade principles. There are many countries negotiating. It could have its teething problems, and it's not the same as the rupee-ruble trade of the years, ages ago. But today, the trade which happens in the name of rupee is helping many of the countries who have dollar shortages. They don't have money to pay in dollars, but they still want the trade because of essential commodities. They still want the trade to go on. So we've evolved to a stage where people recognize Indian rupee can be, in some regions at least, used as instruments or trading currencies. Your macroeconomic stability tells you that. And also the market size itself of India. Middle class has the purchasing power today and people know that there's a captive middle class here for whom they can produce goods. And that number of middle class by 2047 would be anywhere near 102 crores. 
So everybody who wants to produce things, market it, market or produce from here, sell it here and also sell abroad, want to have something to do with India. So even as I'm talking about ways in which we want to build Indian economy in a global situation, which is like, as I said, describable with the VUCA expression, volatile, uncertain, complex, and requiring you to adapt, it is for us very clearly to recognize our strengths. And recognizing our strength means that it is the demography that we have to our advantage. It's also the readiness of digital technology, which common people have even adapted. The skilling that is required for Indian youth to come up with solutions for, let us say, artificial intelligence and the likes of that, the chat GPTs of the world, which we can ourselves create, use, but equally recognize that it can be a double-edged sword. You need to have regulations, at least soft, soft touch regulations, so that it doesn't curb the innovativeness of people. So I'll go back to talking about the G20 once more, where the finance track, which actually is the core for the G20. Many things have gotten added to it, which also give you a lot of value. The core of G20 finance track did not for a moment hesitate when we put this huge agenda forward. We will talk about the digital public infrastructure in which India has an India stack about which we can talk to you. They were willing to hear us and carried that message across. And every time the World Bank met during April and autumn, DPI was one of the biggest subjects that we could speak. And many countries have even chosen to say, let's please share information and see if India can help us out. In not, if not in the entire stack, at least in some few bricks from it from that structure that we've created for ourselves, and that is publicly funded. That amazes many of them, because we've not made sure that uh, these are left for the private entrepreneurs, so that commercially it becomes a very interesting proposition, but it won't help India to have all people adapt to it. Small industries which are looking for markets outside, or consumers who want to do payments and cost less in their transactions, and so on. So whether it was that, whether it was the question of let us have a common regulation when you're talking about cryptocurrencies. They are not currencies, they are crypto assets which are being created because unless it's uh, uh, issued by the central bank of the country or any, mon or any governmental authority, it's not a currency. But yet it required international understanding. We were able to push that agenda forward. We were also able to convince that the institutions, the Bretton Wood institutions, are no longer nimble to meet the 21st century requirements. We convinced the G20 membership that we need to have a look at how World Bank, with all the money that is available at its disposal, is effectively using it to help countries come out of problems, build their developmental activities, take care of the environment concerns and fund them for it. Equally, WHO and other institutions with the corpus that they have, are they really giving remedial solutions even during the pandemic for that matter? We had to sit through the G20 sessions to make sure countries get World Bank, World Health Organization's assistance. So reforming multilateral development banks was a big agenda we took forward. We formed an international expert group. They gave a lot of ideas and that helped in coming up with a formulation and also a time plan. The timeline was given as to who should do when, what, so that this can really get implemented. Also building cities of tomorrow, building resilient uh, disaster release, resilient infrastructure, topics on which it was important to have the global support mechanism so that the future challenges which are literally on us now for a better next generation, whether it is financing our needs for transitioning into an energy basket, which is going to be a lot more sustainable. Get out of those fossil fuels. Is it possible to get out completely? That's a debate. Many countries have gone back in their promise, 
but India is trying to chug along so that the record that we set post COP21 will be sustained even in the future. And the achievements of India in solar and wind energy are now possibly getting replicated in green hydrogen and green ammonia. Electric vehicles are priority for us. So um, the global fora, whether it is the G20 or our engagement in the UN, are all now focusing on India's solution because we have also now taken the global south along with us to voice their concerns. So looking at reforming institutions, which will help us build 21st century better, are also part of this global landscape which is evolving and India's role in it. But I repeat, India is being taken seriously only because your economy is a lot more stable now, your taxation policy is a lot more predictable now, your systems are a lot more transparent now, and people are able to see where the money goes, not just in the welfare measures, but even the investments. We have received the highest FDI beyond 600 billion, and our reserves are also matching to that level. So in a way, it is your fundamentals economy strength, the economic fundamentals being absolutely stable and strong, which gives you that position where people take you seriously, would want to engage with you, and are willing to take you, uh, give them suggestions. As regards Vikasit Bharat, I'll just highlight two other points and end my opening remarks. We are placing a lot of emphasis that in the next 25 years, a few sectors are going to be immensely supported. And this is derived from the policy which was placed in the parliament, the public sector enterprises policy, which very clearly said there shall not be any sector in India which will be reserved only for the government. Government can be present in the core sectors, but Private entrepreneurs will be allowed to be present everywhere. But that doesn't mean that we are going to say defense, strategic uh, positioning are all left to... No, that the government will be present there. Communication, are we saying no telephones, uh, telephone lines will all be provided by private sector? No, BSNLs and MTNLs of the world will be there and they will continue to do, do their business because we need them to uh, deal with the border areas, strategically important areas, and so on. So having said this policy in all its detail, we have opened up every sector now for investments, space, near-orbit missions, deep sea, uh, rare earths, sunrise sectors, are all going to be the priority areas. Artificial intelligence, semiconductors, Manufacturing in India with innovative uh, newer tools are all going to be priority areas where policy and fiscal supports will be extended. But over and above this, skilling of our people, ensuring that they are ready to be employed as they come out of their colleges and universities, making sure that they adapt at using technology, making sure that they can also become the innovative centers for artificial intelligence, where you can come out with innovative tools derived from AI, have a sandbox to test them, and be able to use it both for India and for the benefit of other countries. Education and health, as always, will receive support from the government so that the fundamentals of education infrastructure in the country is improved and stabilized. Higher education under the new economic uh, education policy is already, and even the primary, primary education, is already open for learning in mother tongue, learning even higher education in mother tongue, flexibility of multidisciplinary learning, all that is part of the new education policy. So your Vikasit Bharat, the path towards it, the support mechanism which the government can do, um, I'm not very comfortable in Hindi, but... Um, Government, uh, once the Prime Minister did say, Abhavna hona chahiye sarkar ka, or dusra, 
something else, also ending with a bow. So no excess presence of the government, nor there is a complete absence of government. So minimum uh, government and maximum governance will be the route with which we go forward. So I can go on like this, but I'll stop here. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. The Honorable Minister has very kindly and graciously agreed uh, to take a few questions. Uh, as usual, we'll have the students of the International School of International Studies come first. Yeah, the light green kurta. No. Hello. Yeah. Good evening, ma'am. Thanks for the speech. You initially at the beginning of the speech, you mentioned the slashing of corporate tax rates. However, the trickle down theory of free market capitalism is seeing great stress nowadays. Moreover, the corporates that are being funded, for example, under the scheme of production linked incentive, they are increasingly depending upon capital incentive intensive technologies uh, due to which lesser jobs are being created. Now, uh, how do you see it? as the demographic dividend of India in this uh, situation of Amrit Kal will be increasingly demanding better standards of livelihood. Thank you. Thank you. Can we take a couple of questions? And a gender balance. Yes. Yeah. Pink. So I have two questions. One question is one regarding question. Yeah, one question. Okay, I mean, in the light of recent farmer protests, ma'am, uh, could you say uh, what is India's stance in World Trade Organization? So uh, does your government does it support minimum uh, support price, and what is your stance in WTO? Thank you. One uh, somewhere here in the middle. Yeah. Okay. Good morning. Thank you, ma'am, for the wonderful presentation. I'm Shantan Mondavadhyay from Center for South Asian Studies. Ma'am, I want to ask you about the IMF bailout package which Sri Lanka got. I have read in the newspapers that India also helped in the process. So how did we help Sri Lanka to get the bailout package? Can you elaborate on that? Thank you, ma'am. Um, see, this uh, question about capital tax. It's a corporate tax rate reduction. India's, India was one of those countries which had very high level taxation for companies. Um, and therefore, it was felt that businesses wouldn't want to come and invest, especially at that time. We were still talking of wanting to, as I said, 2019, we were still wanting to have more investments made so that uh, that in, in turn increases the production brings in jobs, and there is a lot of, uh, you know, natural cycle of uh, vicious, wish, virtuous cycle which can be built up. So, and also at that time, there were globally very many countries which wanted to attract in investment, who were also contemplating on changing their tax structure for the corporate. We went ahead and did it, and today I can tell you it has made a lot of difference. Investments are happening, greenfield, brownfield, and as a result of which, in fact, uh, today the uh, credit offtake from banks are also improving. Naturally, when investments happen and production-related activities, because this was given only for manufacturing companies, not given for services, uh, you expect uh, industrial activity to grow and therefore also impact on jobs. That is exactly where that 2019 decision was taken up. And even now I would think that that is the way uh, to go forward in that direction and make sure that the newer additional capacities which are coming are coming in areas which are going to be job uh, created. If there is a perception that uh, it may not have resulted in as many jobs as was in the olden days of investment. It's also because 
even as we took this decision, we were aware the industrial um, revolution, what was called as 4.0, was setting in. Web 3 was coming in, which is what is now being talked about as AI and generative chat, uh, uh, GPTs and so on. Matter of fact is industry, particularly in manufacturing, is going through huge transition, reset, if I can use the word. And when resets happen, the labor force is also catching up with skills that are so required for meeting with those reset which is happening in industry. So there will be requirement of labor not to be where they are and also be expecting to employ. That is why the government has ramped up uh, skilling and upskilling people who have to get into industry. I can give you, sorry for this long answer for one question, I can give you examples of industry spread not just in uh, Haryana or uh, Uttar Pradesh, parts of uh, Maharashtra or Rajasthan, also from the south, saying that post-COVID, the very workers who they trained and were doing wonderful job in their, let's say, spinning mills or cotton mills or textile or any other activity, did not come back. They had this usual way of, you know, somebody would link up with a hundred workers here, hundred workers there, hundred or two hundred or three thousand or whatever number. The very same people who would mop these people up and then ensure that they would travel to the place said, no, there are others willing to come, but these people are not. So what are these people doing? I was literally talking, and these are anecdotal experiments. Studies will prove it later. These very skilled manpa decided to stay back where they are and probably take up assignments there, but now that they find a few, a set of uh, industries coming in the locales, or going for better bargain, wage bargain, and moving to other areas, nearer home, perhaps. And the new set of people who are coming, and the local people who have been recruited, at least in the south, are all being skilled now for the levels at which industry want them. The industry also wants them at a different level now because they've brought in robotics, they're brought in into smart systems using digitization. So long and short of it, there is a transition and reset happening between industry and labor. So if we are looking at only the old fashioned, oh, what's happening in cement industry? What's happening in iron and steel? No, there are newer industries coming, newer workforces coming out. They are being trained and they are being put in. Renewables. Tell me the number of people who are servicing renewable sector. Did they exist before? They are existing now. Um, MSP, WTO, farmers, our position in the WTO, since the time I was in commerce, is the same. We cannot have a few countries having gone through the MSP route and who continue. They may not call it as MSP, they support their farmers. But only when India and many other countries like India want to procure grains from farmers at a minimum support price and keep it as a buffer stock, use it for PDS, there is a problem. There's a, the problem comes at this end. They say if you procured it and kept it in your go-downs, wanting to use it for PDS, for the poor, and for MSP, because you want to support the poor farmers, both ends, the consideration being the poor, the consumer and the producer. WTO has a problem if you kept this stock, and occasionally, because either the grain is getting older or because you want to make sure that the prices in the market don't shoot up and you bring this release from the go-downs so that the market can be cooled, they don't approve of such intervention activities. We have been explaining to the WTO that it is important for the farmer as much as it is important for the consumer. End of the day, it is also important because in a country like India, where people who don't get covered by a PDS also should have affordable grains in the market. So these are necessary steps for a country which still has a subs uh, substantial number of people living at uh, wanting to buy goods uh, which are affordable. So this fight continues. But unfortunately, 
A step was taken in 2013, if I remember correct, sometime in December, one of the ministerial was held in WTO. And in that ministerial, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, I would want to put it that way, diplomatically, India agreed to a position saying, 2017 onwards, we would not procure MSP-based grains, which meant India would not be able to distribute food grains under the PDS. The moment we took over in 2014 and we saw this ministerial proceedings, we hit the panic button and negotiated with WTO, eventually succeeded in bringing what is now called as a peace clause. A peace clause whereby we will continue to do what we have been doing till such a time a permanent solution is arrived at for this mechanism in any country inclusive of India. So that permanent, uh, per permanent solution not having been arrived till today, this peace clause will hold good for perpetuity, meaning till such a time they find a solution. So that's our position which continues even today. We would have risked a big uh, possibility of MSP being cut down had we not intervened in time to get the peace clause. That's about the farmers. But we have also, uh, until today, we are fighting for the rights of small fishermen because they are livelihood-based fishermen and their rights in the coast cannot be affected by this, uh, you know, 200 uh, nautical miles where your economic zone is and fishing vessels from other areas can come and do deep sea trawling and go away. So we are fighting for the rights of traditional Indian fishermen. So is there anything else left in your question? Okay. Sri Lanka bailout. Who was it who asked that question? All right. Yeah. Yes, during the crisis that Sri Lanka was going through, they had a fuel shortage. They couldn't pay for the fuel which they so needed. They also had problems of paying in foreign currency. So in the clearing houses, their, uh, their payment demands went unmet. So India came in to help them by supplying fuel, by supplying them with uh, medicines and other necessities. Also ensured that we sent them cooking gas, cylinders went from India. We ensured that the payments get honored in the clearing houses by us coming in. That was an arrangement which, uh, guided by the Finance Ministry, the Reserve Bank of India, working together with the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, worked on that. So the help uh, was both in cash and kind, and uh, it was at different times per their requirement. But I would think that uh, it reached a peak when the IMF uh, package was being discussed and negotiated. India being one of the lenders uh, or creditor to Sri Lanka, along with Japan, China, and France, I think. We spoke with IMF and said we want them to be given the package because we want them to come out of the distress that they've gone in. So yes, at different stages, different types of help. Uh, also, some faculty members, uh, Professor Panasani, would you like to ask a question? Since you're an external member of CPOD, I know you well. Yeah, just wait for the mic. Uh, no, I don't have a question per se, but I was intrigued about uh, the peace clause because I, I, I'm aware of the uh, agriculture agreement which doesn't allow us to have what they call price distorting subsidy, which is very unfortunate. And India has been uh, very active in the current uh, negotiations, saying that you know the way it is calibrated should be changed. But I would certainly like to hear a little bit more on the peace clause. I wasn't aware of that. Thank you. Amit, the senior most professor of SIS. It was a pleasure listening to you, ma'am. Um, and for a change, I must say, I must confess that um, I'm listening to somebody who is forward thinking. Because what we have noticed in the past years is government often responds to events that have already occurred. And then we are sort of late comers in terms of tackling those. Now here we are talking about forward thinking. 
So I have one specific question for you. I mean, if you could throw some light on how the government is thinking ahead on this particular issue. We all know that the advent of uh, Industrial Revolution 4.0, you did mention about it, you know, big data, artificial intelligence. The world economy is going to be governed by technologies for which certain critical resources, minerals are absolutely critical. Now, we have to ensure critical mineral resource security so that we have access to these resources. So if you could throw some light on how India is thinking about, because China is going big time, you know, sort of strategizing with Africa and with other countries too. So if you can throw some light on that. Thank you, ma'am. One more final question, Gulshan? Yeah. Professor Gulshan Sachdev. Thank you. Um, no, I'm from the European Studies, and years back, you know, you did your own research on India-Europe trade. Uh, so when you are, as a policymaker now, negotiating FTA, so what change do you really see as a policymaker and as a student when you were actually doing research? The peace clause very attractive name given and probably practical name because we were creating ruckus and they wanted us to calm down. <laughs> but behind it was the fact that some way that which continued since the GATT framework and the very well-known Doha round, the problem is festering. What actually this peace clause has given us is a temporary relief. But we are satisfied by saying this temporary can be perpetual. But the fact remains that the attempt is always to make sure that countries like India don't anymore give subsidies to their farming community. Don't anymore subsidize on food related items. Eventually, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist even for a moment, but eventually it means that your production, even as it is now, production of some crops are not really cost effective. And that's not to uh, blame the farmer. The input costs are something which doesn't go along with farm productivity. It only goes on adding to it. Productivity and efficiencies are still yet catching up with it. So if the the idea of WTO constantly keeping the milepost where it was, that subsidies given till now by developed countries during the post-war era is acceptable. But even if a farmer has not, sometimes farmers in the West are told, don't produce, I'll give you what you earn. Through a productive year, what you earn will be given to you, but don't produce because there's excess production. They don't know how to sell it, at what cost to sell it, there's, that is why in my days, I don't know if you remember, there used to be wheat mountains and uh, milk lakes. They were metaphorically being said that. They were exporting even powdered, some kind of a powdered uh, milk, which was not even up to our taste. They were exporting what was called butter oil, which was not ghee, which is not even an edible oil. It is an edible oil, but which is not suitable for Indian palate. These things came because they had surfeit of it. But what this one continues to do for us, and for many of the countries, Brazil, South Africa, many of these smaller countries also voice this concern, that you cannot bring in any subsidy element. We freeze what we've already given to our farmers for our animal husbandry people, for our fishermen. But when you come here, you come on those terms. It just cannot happen that way. So we are protesting and therefore what we said was, if this 2013 agreement has to be implemented, we need to know when it is and give us a permanent solution, which is going to be conducive for all members of the WTO. It cannot be in the terms of one set of countries against the other. That's your peace clause. Your question was on critical resources. Even yesterday, you would have noticed the cabinet day before yesterday, was it Wednesday, <coughs> cabinet had cle uh, cleared prospecting and mining of very many, nearly 20-odd rare materials, rare earths. 
India is abundant in many of them. May not be abundant in some of them. But for those some, we've already started talking with very many countries, inclusive of Australia, some Latin American countries, and in some, the negotiations have all reached the final stages, agreements are being sorted out. So India is not lagging behind. We may have joined this race a bit later, but we are really into it, uh, obtaining mines, production rights abroad, equally opening up so many others which have been lying dormant in India so that we use this as well. Professor, you asked me about FTA as a student or a scholar FTA and a policy a maker. Mind sense have not changed. <laughs> Europe remains. Uh, this is going live, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the negotiation also will have to be on India's not 1947 India. India today can sit up and talk to you, looking into your eyes. We are no longer as dependent as the Western world probably wanted us to be. And this is not just a being, uh, we are not just being arrogant or self-assured. Matter of fact, we have shown the development. So when we negotiate, we want to negotiate from a position of strength on certain grounds, a position of we can give you something, you can in turn give us something else. And on those items in which we think we'll be better off if they open up, we certainly say that this is our wish list. So negotiation today goes with a different spirit. And I'm deliberately saying this, even as uh, recent as 2010, 11, 12, agreements with the ASEAN countries. I'm sure many of you as students and faculty also look at the ASEAN agreement and its language makes me sit up each time with anxiety. If anything so laid back, if anything so casual, and giving away things which we are unable to retrieve even today. There's not even a review clause. Unless both the parties agree, you can't even have a review. Certainly a party, they're all our friends. I'm not uh, pointing a finger otherwise. Unless a party feels that on some grounds they're losing out, on some other grounds where India wants them to come and review, they won't even come for a review. But if the agreement has been so good to them, why would they want to review? ASEAN suffers from that. So now I know the Commerce Ministry is going through a process of reviewing it. So FTAs, the way we negotiate, the way we tighten the language with which you agree, and the way you put in clause which gives a window for them and for us to review, Unless you do all this, your FTAs are not going to deliver the way you wish them to deliver. ASEAN is a classic case where it's gone against us. And government is unable to retract or bring them on the table to say, come, let's have an open discussion. Because they're happily benefiting of it. I won't blame them. It's up to us to take care of our interest. So when we are negotiating with the Europeans, we are negotiating with the UK, post-Brexit, it is separate with them, not party to the European Union. We are also negotiating with EFTA, the Switzerland and uh, Finland and some of the Nordic countries. So most of these countries have already brought their tariffs down to almost zero. So there's not going to be a possibility of them doing anything more for us. But we need our goods to reach there. So if I were to compare the time when I'm talking about my research, it was under a totally different framework. That was an era where, you know, the GATT framework worked and you also had 
Indian textiles go there under certain preferential treatment because you were still a, a low-income developing country. And in that particular sector, which is also a thumb rule that they apply, in that particular sector, you had not reached yet, say, a 15% level of the global trade. For this particular commodity, if you're trading, and if globally this has already reached, India's share has reached 15%, you shall not have any more preferences given. We hadn't reached, what, 15, not even 7, 8% then. So it was brilliant to get it through the GSP, the general scheme of preferences. But today, not just in textiles, in many others, we've already crossed the 15% threshold. So you're not going to get any favorable treatment uh, from them. So you're negotiating. And their uh, desire is they, we give them a lot more opening in automobiles, a sector in which we are shown immense prospects. Indian automobile companies are doing very well. At this time, how much would you want to open up is a question. Because it shouldn't be that we opened up and ruined a growing industry in India. So, so much of calibration is required now under each sector. That's the difference, stark difference that I find. Earlier, if you would be happy with entry into the market with three or four main items, now every item is ready to go. We need to calibrate them by the HSN codes. So this one is fine so long as it has black cover. So you, this goes in, but provided you give black cover. I'm, I'm just sort of simplistically giving this example. But you are looking at a list of about 13,000 items and seeing which one can be offered and which one can gain. So the negotiations are a lot more calibrated now. Uh, Ma'am, I've been told that we're eating into your next appointment. So let me say that this has been a brilliant address. And thank you very much for answering all the questions. May I request Professor Bhava now to propose a formal vote of thanks? Thank you, Dean. Namaskar and good afternoon. On behalf of the program committee of the Kunzru Memorial Lecture 2024, it's my very pleasant task uh, to propose a vote of thanks. May I first request the Dean uh, of SIS, Professor Amitabh Mattu, to uh, felicitate the Honorable Minister uh, of Finance and Corporate Affairs, uh, Srimati Nirmala Sita Raman, with a plaque of the JNU. Ma'am, I take this opportunity to thank you for coming here to deliver the valedictory lecture. Uh, if you could kindly be seated for a couple of minutes. Uh, your lecture today was...